Good morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to this week's Weekly Energy Boost. My name is Ali Sheva, and I am here this lovely Monday morning with both David Guillaume and Marcus Weston, who we'll hear from momentarily. This is the third episode that we are doing on the topic of food, eating, and nutrition, and we are focusing this week on spiritual weight loss. And that, that title may be a little bit misleading. It might be exactly what we're gonna talk about depending on where you're coming from this morning or wherever, whenever it is you're listening to this episode. The Weekly Energy Boost is a seven day spiritual energy forecast. We use the wisdom of Kabbalah to <coughs> glean and curate the most powerful and practical wisdom and tools for our listeners. And this, our podcast is intended for Anybody, whether you are on a spiritual path or not, you study Kabbalah or not, this is really an introduction to how powerful and how practical the wisdom of Kabbalah can be. And this month we've been focusing on eating and food because as as uh, any parents or any Leos will tell you, food is important. We're, we're smack dab in the middle of the month of Leo. And um, the, our, our focus has really been on consuming, how do we consume, what we consume, and why we consume it. So this week's episode is really focused more on a couple of fundamental principles that I'm going to introduce today, and then we'll hear from uh, our fabulous co-guests. Um, I think first and foremost, the important teaching to start with is that the body is a reflection of the soul, that the Kabbalists teach as above, so below. And there's a, a journey that the soul takes in each lifetime whereupon it picks the body that it's going to be housed in. The body is the, the temple for the soul, and it cannot do its work without that vehicle, without that physical mechanism, not only to go from here to there, but also the body is used as the conduit for energy, even though the soul is... Uh, experiencing the connection, the body as the mirror of the soul, as the house of the soul, engages in um, actions or lack of actions that either connect us or disconnect us. And one of the examples we brought up in the first episode was how in prayer, right, we sit when we're manifesting energy. So too, the Kabbalists talk about the importance of sitting down to eat and how both are connected to manifestation of energy. We stand in prayer when we are throwing the fishing line to connect with whatever we'd like to draw, and then when we want to manifest it, we seat. We sit. So, <laughs> I like whoops. that. Throwing the fishing line. I like that. that that's, but that's really what we do. That we're smart we're you. casting our line, and then we reel it in as if, when we're seated. And so when we look at our physical body, there's all different kinds of teachings that we can get into, even with regard to meditation. The Kabbalists teach when we meditate, we should not cross our arms and legs because both our arms and legs are conduits for energy and we don't want to cross those wires. So as we look at what it means to be spiritually healthy and to consume things that are spiritually supportive. And I use the word consume because we're not only talking about food. We're talking about media. We're talking about what do we read. We're talking about um, where do we hang out. All of those are components of how we consume what nourishes us. David brought up a really cool uh, point last week where he was saying that, you know, when you consume different food groups, if all the different food groups have different energies, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go back to last week's episode. So imagine you're consuming three different kinds of foods, three different kinds of energies. What, what kind of spiritual, uh, to quote David, mishmash <laughs> does that create in the body and therefore in the soul? So one of the things we want to examine this week is how our energy impacts our physical being and vice versa. I was, I was test, I, I've tested a lot of different things physically and I always like to see their impact spiritually and of all the different ways I've tried to deal with food or dieting or exercise there's one that has worked very well and I talk to other people and they all say the same thing and I'm, I'm curious as to the well I'm not curious I, I did see what the spiritual side of of this is is portion control and not 
overeating, meaning you can eat what you want to eat to some extent. But as long as you eat it in moderation, that is going to maximize both the healing in the body, a highest level of energy, because food, what food does, we think food provides energy. Food takes energy. Food is actually absorbing, taking your body's power. Your body requires energy to digest the food, to break down the food, to do what it needs to do. And if you think about it spiritually, and all the different souls that exist within food, we talked about this, the sparks of light. Just imagine like you have to like, you have to like break, break open this shell to take out this spark. So even the soul has to do work to extract the light that it needs. So the more food we give the body, we think it's more fuel, it's more energy. But actually, it's the opposite. It, it takes energy. Why do we say not to eat right before bed? If anything, give, give more nutrients to your body right before bed so that you can sleep better. And it's, it's the opposite, that if your body needs to give energy to break down food while you sleep, then the body is not using the energy to heal throughout the night. So portion control, which pretty much means not eating until you're stuffed, is both a physical marvel and also backed by spirituality. Uh, so uh, again, we're not talking about like dieting and not eating for a whole day and then all of a sudden binge eating because that, that's reactive. And that's why most diets can be reactive because you deprive yourself and then you try to make up for that deprivation by binging and, 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 and as opposed to dealing with what's really going on inside of, of why, why we have those cravings. But, <clears throat> you know, just, just eating to the point where you know you've given your body exactly what it needs and not giving it more so that it sucks energy from the rest of you. What do you think about that? Well. Marcus. <laughs> Welcome to the microphone, Marcus Weston. Well, I got to say, first of all, it's just lovely to be here in Los Angeles. It's even lovelier to be on the, the Elie Sheva Giam show, <laughs> what we're calling it these days, the Kanji Boost. Um, uh, but the most exciting thing to be here is just talking about food. <laughs> <laughs> and the promise right. of a nice lunch afterwards. I got to tell you, when I, I invited Marcus to a lecture I gave last night, and he's <laughs> like, the first question he asked, like, is there food? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but don't I mean, come for like, the amazing people. And, the and, and just to be clear, I couldn't actually go. And, my and then he said, can I Uber him the food from the event? <laughs> he literally said, can you Uber the, the, can you send me the food? The attendants, just can you bring me back some sushi? <laughs> Um, so, so I, I feel very qualified to, uh, <laughs> to sit here today, both perhaps wearing a, a Kabbalah hat, um, but also I have many food issues. <laughs> um, I'm a foodaholic. Um, I'm obsessed by food. Um, really, I mean that very literally to the point where, where I have difficulty eating other people's food because <laughs> it probably isn't prepared with the exact... I find that when you become expert in anything, it's interesting, I was playing tennis this morning and, and you kind of think about the idea that the person I was, I was playing against could tell exactly from my stance and my grip and my backswing, everything good and bad about my game and, and, and knew exactly where strengths and weaknesses were. And I think if you have an obsession about something, you become great in that area and the, the expansion or depth of your capacity to understand the otherwise invisible components um, uh, are, are clear to you. And so the palate of a foodie or, or a connoisseur, if you go to, I went up to one of the, the, the wine, one of the, the Herzog wine uh, cellar, right? Or regions of mostly to eat actually. Uh, <laughs> and, and just hearing about the sommelier, right? And I was, it was fascinated because, because the, the, this guy clearly can, can taste um, 10 grapes and know exactly what percentage of what grape to put with what to create fantastic wine outputs. And, and it's just extraordinary that his palate is, is, is 20 times more able to discern food than I am. So I'm fascinated by those things. <laughs> and, and, and I'm in love with food. In fact, my two joys in life, putting aside my wife and kids clearly, um, <laughs> which isn't obvious just for the, the legal caveat, um, <laughs> Is, is the Zohar. I'm passionate. I'm in love with the Zohar. I'm in love with the Zohar and, and food. I, I, Michael will often tease me 
Um, if only you had as much joy for everything else in life as you do to eat. Um, and I would say this, my claim to fame, my claim to fame um, uh, is that occasionally, secretly, perhaps not anymore, Monica the vegetarian might come to me for steak or has historically. So that's a very big uh, 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 self-introduction. So what are we talking about? Food. Yeah, I was going to say, like, <laughs> do you have something to share with our, with our audience? No, that the, whoever sits there is just the, in a confessional. I'm so excited. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm like, wait, can you add some value to the audience and tell them something that's going to change their life? Well, I think you have a lot of point. profound wisdom. That's the first point. I think, I think the extraordinary joy, <laughs> the joy, it is overwhelming how, how it, is, it is actually ridiculous how fulfilled I am from food. <laughs> from the right kind of food. And, and what does that mean? So it, that's a big secret. It's a big you're, secret. You're sharing that is. a secret. Because, because I remember years ago, you know, the Rav stooped to pick up this, this dime coin from the floor after being, you know, 70 something years old. And, and, and why make all that effort to go and pick up that dime? If a beggar can have so much joy from this particular dime, mm. why can't I exude that same or, or kind of extract that same uh, amount of, of light? So, why not? There is so much happiness to be had. And I'm sure there are many stories of Kabbalists that, 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 that have been into different kinds of things, but the joy they have is their connection to the Creator. And, and so there is an extraordinary amount of light in food. It's been written about historically by Kabbalists uh, uh, through scriptures incessantly. I mean, the whole idea of kosher is, is the obsession of extracting light from food, right? Kosher isn't just a kind of a club. <laughs> and and it's for a few people. Um, kosher is. Have you spoken about this? We didn't get there yet. Well, there's an interesting idea, right? Because for <laughs> me, for me, the idea of kosher is 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 what is going to support your soul's work, right? So you can eat things that might fulfill your body, um, and you can eat things that might taste fantastic. But at the end of the day, what what you're eating is is the fuel to your body's work. Right. And the question is, do you want your body's work to be spiritually bound or do you want your body's work to be egotistically bound? And, and kosher for me is that kind of delineation. Um, uh, you know, I am aware there is something just to kind of uh, talk much more than you for a second. There is a um, uh, there is a Kabbalist who says that if you get too excited by food, which I'm always thinking about because I do get overly excited, like really too excited. Um, he says that you, you denigrate your soul to the level of the animal. I think maybe it's the Rambam or, or I'm sure who said that. But I think that's an interesting idea. You, you get too excited by things beneath you. You denigrate your soul to that lower level mm. because you're, you're actually almost idolizing the physical joy or the light in the food or pops the food. Well, you become versus, the vessel, yeah. not the cause. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I want to clarify something because you dropped the kosher bomb. <laughs> and I think it needs I think it needs a little context. Yeah. And and without getting into a whole series of classes about this topic, because we have a lot we have listeners from all our countries all around the world, different religious backgrounds, different cultures, and food is treated differently in, 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 in these different countries and nations. And to to simplify it, this whole idea of kosher as the Bible gives it to us, if I had to make it something practical for everybody it's this idea that there are s kosher is the defining certain foods that have some kind of a spiritual responsibility behind them. And then there are sparks of light that can be elevated and then used for the sake of creation and my own spiritual growth. So it's not to say that if I don't eat kosher, I'm a bad person. We have to really get that narrative out. It's this idea that there, there are sparks of light within food that are deemed, quote unquote, kosher, that I can utilize and extract should I have the consciousness to do so that could benefit both me and mankind. Uh, so I really, want, I really wanted to make that clear. The only thing I want to add is that I think a lot of people perceive foods that qualify as kosher as ones that have been blessed. We talked a little bit about blessing yeah, before. Yeah. I just want to make sure it's clear. That's yeah, not that what, has nothing to do with that it. has nothing to do with it. It's more the categories, and we talked about the categories last week about, you know, there's um, products that originate from milk, products that originate from the flesh of animal. We, we got into it a little bit last week in terms of what, what part of me do those different ca categories of food nourish? 
So David is taking, or Marcus and David are taking it to a level higher, is that the whole system of that is really about giving what I consume structure so that my own spiritual growth is supported by that structure and not inhibited by it. And I, and I wanted to piggyback on what Marcus said, which was, and I heard this once from a lecture, it was, it was a lecture of Michael Berg, and he was quoting Kabbalist, that a lot of times we're all looking for stimulation and energy. That's probably one of our downfalls is that we constantly want to be stimulated by something, and society has trained us to be so, that we're, we end up becoming in a constant reactive state. And as a result, we're not connected to the light of the Creator. And so the different blessings that we're looking for in our lives are just kind of put off because we're always just in the reactive state. And reactive basically means I'm looking for a form of instant gratification to fill a need inside of myself. And, and what Marcus said <coughs> that was quoting Michael Berg, was quoting a Kabbalist from before was that every single object in this world actually has an endless amount of energy. We're only kind of eating the proverbial muffin top of, 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 <laughs> of, of, of sparks of light and all these things. So for example, I drink this coffee, technically this coffee has endless amounts of energy, so much so that the secrets of financial prosperity for myself, the secrets of how to make sure my children become the greatest they can be, the secrets of health and healing actually exist within this cup of coffee. If I were to know how to extract all the like mil milk, no pun, milk from, <laughs> from the coffee, all the sparks of light, and you can only do so by having consciousness about that. And so when Marcus is saying how much he enjoys food, the way I took it, because I think Marcus is constantly of a higher consciousness, and I, and I look up to that, is that when he drinks coffee, he's not, he's not enjoying it because it tastes good. He's enjoying it because he knows there are 125 spiritual levels of light that he's extracting just from this one little object, and then he moves on to the next item of food and extracts that same light there. And I used 125 because there are 125 spiritual levels, which we talked about in other sessions. So I think that's a really profound thing, that when you're eating, one of the reasons why we still stay hungry or we feel like we need to eat more is we're just eating the muffin top of all of these things and not actually saying, I'm going to take all the light from this one object in front of me. There's so much energy in every little object. And I think, I think it's the spiritual weight loss as well, right? Because, because I think most of us, as you say, are eating for stimulation or we're eating something reactively. And so what happens is you start to eat the energy that you want, mm. right? So for example, if you're not feeling, or if you have a sugar food, that's a very obvious go-to, a sugar food, a cake, uh, uh, lots of people have little sugar issues, little, like, like a sweet tooth. You're, 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 you're eating the sweetness that you want to feel in your life potentially. You don't feel sweet yourself, or you don't feel loved sweetly by another, or perhaps you don't feel uh, a sense of self-care or a sense of happiness, right? It's very difficult. How, how does, you know, I mean, how many people just don't feel happy? That, that's one of the biggest metrics of, of, of spiritual work is, is do you feel happy 24-7? And the answer most people will clearly say is, is, is no. Well, what are you doing to try and feel happy, which is that soul's desire every day? Well, I do lots of things, and one of them is probably eat. Hmm. And, and, and then to eat the wrong thing sugars the need that we have and so we're eating our spiritual work like to sugarcoat the problem yes exactly and so there is a kind of weight gain and that weight gain might not be a physical weight gain but it's definitely a spiritual heaviness and so most of us carry that kind of baggage around with us that we satiate or deny by eating foods that make us feel it's really a drug <laughs> it's a legal drug it uh, is perhaps less dangerous, or perhaps not actually. I, I when would. you see when you see what goes on, we talked about it in a previous episode about the specifically in the U.S. the lack of you know food is supposed to be medicine, and the way that it's treated right. is like a drug instead. Right. right. So w one of the goals of these episodes is to really shift how we look at the spiritual tool of food, so that it's no longer becoming that fix. That, yeah. that we use it as. And imagine, imagine if you said to a typical person, listen, we're going to put you on um, a, a crazy, amazing, medicinal, food, natural diet regimen. We're going to put you in some field in the middle <laughs> of nowhere, 
and, you're, and gonna, you're gonna forage and you're gonna live off the land <laughs> and eat leaves all day and that's gonna really make you powerful most of us would think that's torture we're so conditioned to the drug of food that when the medicine of food pops up we think that's torture that's how mm. much our ego is that's how enslaved we are in the world of food mm. we, we start to think good things are bad for us and bad things are good for us because the tasty food is the bad stuff clearly I, lo I love looking at data, and I was reading over the weekend about the repeat. It sounds really boring, but it's going to be interesting. <laughs> the re repeat purchase rate of like sodas over, over time in the last couple of 20 years, 30 years. So uh, it was amazing. I was, I was learning about Coca Cola that it has like a higher purchase rate than, let's say, Fanta or Sprite or whatever it is. And uh, obviously, the obvious, the obvious reason of the. Re so the discussion was, is it a branding thing? Is it whatever? But the fact is that they have caffeine. And because caffeine is addictive, it, it increases the purchase rate. So you got to imagine that these companies sit in boardrooms and they, they, they're thinking, well, how do we get our consumers to buy and buy again and buy again? And it's very simple. Create something that provides enough energy to be addictive. And obviously, you know, your revenues go up. It's neither here nor there. I thought it was an interesting fact. And I read it this weekend, so I thought I would share it. Another interesting thing was I was, I was on vacation once. And I, was, I was hungry. And we, we were like driving. My wife and I, we didn't have any food. And I said, I'm really hungry. I want food. And so she hands me a bottle of water. And I, and I said, well, what, what, what am I supposed to do with this? She's like, eat the water. And she was like totally serious. I'm like, what do you mean eat the water? I'm hot. This is going to make me more hungry. She's like, eat the water. Meditate and chew it and eat it. And you'll see it will satiate you. And then when you get hungry again, eat more water. I don't know why I'm sharing that. I thought that was a powerful concept. It well, is. That we, should, we should give that context as well. <laughs> David's wife is a certified, what are all her certifications? Yeah, she has a lot of yeah, certifications. Like in the health food. and nutrition and food world. So yeah. David, a lot of the time, David, well, first of all, every episode, David brings up a digestion metaphor. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, learn this, I don't learn this like from God. Like, I don't know selling. Yes. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> So, but the 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 validity of what David shares, or the fact that he's interested in all these different um, consumer theories and and <laughs> approaches, has to do with his other the, the other fifty percent of the his life, which is is working around nutrition and supplements and and health support with things we consume. The colon fascinates yes, me. It well, never David did until I got married, but now all I think about is the colon. <laughs> Well, Definitely the next topic. <laughs> not just I'm that. Not, invited not to. just that. Both of you brought up a really important thing that we actually did get a few questions about this week, was about addictions around food, and where do they come from, and how do we circumvent those addictions? Because our higher self, mm. if we're when, when we are in touch with that higher part of ourselves, I think that the being perceiving addiction, it's almost an insult, but yet at the same time, we have those moments where. We hope nobody's looking or, you know, I, I sneak that Diet Coke or mm. the Coke for that matter. And, um, you know, then I feel guilty about it. And at the same time, I'm trying to achieve this level of elevation and and impact and influence. But I'm hiding in my cubicle drinking a Diet Coke mm. or whatever it is. So I think we need to give a little bit of time and energy to something. I don't, I don't know that anybody is exempt from is that need when when the need overcomes our common sense and our higher self and our goals and everything we stand for the other 23 hours and 55 minutes of the day. Well, we want to give people practical solutions to, to curb and overcome any type of addictive behavior because that is where our correction is. And that is where I, I spoke about this last night in, in, in a lecture. It was about soulmates, but people asked, people asked, you know, how do I find my soulmate? It was like the most common question. I went around the crowd. I said, what do you want to hear? They said, I want, to find how, I want to know how to find my soulmate. And I'm thinking, well, when a person starts to overcome their addictive behavior and patterns and their neediness uh, for anything, that's when they start to open up the gates of soulmates and sustenance and, and coming from <laughs> – are you looking at my salad? Da I just wanted to point out, David, <laughs> up until I started talking this morning, David was munching a gr very green salad in the studio oh, with us. And it's sitting here like open with a fork in it. And we're all just like looking at it. It's this awkward salad. That's the like fourth, salad. the fourth person on the podcast is David Salad today. <laughs> I feel like you put 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 some headphones on it. <laughs> so 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 
going back to what we're talking about, that as long as I have addictive behavior, and one of the ones that came up in the night was that one of the one of the ladies shared that she's addicted to her parents' approval, and that plays a big role in her life. That doing everything for her parents. And That's a very face. high level of awareness, by the way. Most people who have that kind of addiction are not aware that they have an addiction to approval. Right. She came up with that after we did a workshop of that thing that we need to let go to let the soulmate in, the soulmate energy. And so she said that because she's doing everything from her parents' approval, and, and, and she, she was Persian, so more Middle Eastern culture has more of that, what does my dad want from me? What does my mom want from me? So that is something that holds us back. That is a form of addiction. It's not a food addiction. But any type of I need something from you is going to block you from fulfillment and, and the greater gifts of life. I think a lot of us also are, um, are very checked out of our bodies. And, and so as we become more and more disembodied, so, so the, the body becomes our, our only, you know, we're the same from our souls, right? So the body becomes the kind of force of instant gratification. Mm. And so... Food for me is is an emotion that I'm eating, mm. right? And, and many people are compensating for something the soul needs with the body, like a drug. So, so if you were to kind of pause and not eat in the moment that food that you so crave, what would be the emotion that you're compensating for? Um, and, and there's a whole list of potential things. But I think on the back of that, you've got to layer in discipline to your, your, even your eating habits, right? I, I find that, that my slavery of food, I can talk about with so much joy because I have over many years developed a very significant discipline in how I eat. And that includes intermittent fasting. It includes certain diets. It includes certain foods that I, I, I cut out completely. It, in, it includes what I will break my fast in the morning with. It includes um, certain things that I, I allow myself. I've been told not to eat meat, right? And, and I just won't listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are certain things you shouldn't listen to in life. And, <laughs> and, um, and, Don't and, surround yourself with such <laughs> negative people. Right? Exactly. Yeah, no, I ask, why do I attract them? Yeah. <laughs> such negative people. But, but, but it's interesting, by, by, by the way, about, about meat, because eventually it says people will become vegetarian, right? Which is really scary to me. Um, uh, the idea that, that, have you spoken about this in, in, in your podcast? It, it's a fascinating idea that, that people previously were vegetarian. I think the Noah Flood thing yeah. was the beginning. And then, and then, you know, towards the end of time, it says people will again become vegetarian. And, and, and that, if you're like me, is utterly shocking. And, and scary and something to kind of... And all the Leos that are listening are like, heck oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no <laughs> way. But what's fascinating about that, and this is really something which interests me, because I'm such a carnivore, is, is I want meat so much because and only because there are sparks of light in that animal that I, in my soul's journey, need to elevate. So sparks of my light sit in that meat for me to elevate. And at some point, when I've elevated all those sparks of light back to me from the reincarnation of animals, which is a whole different topic, but, but once those sparks return to me, due to me, I will have no more desire for animal. Because the only thing I want is the light. It was the spark of light in the animal. It wasn't just the flesh, even though it sounds very lovely. Perhaps not to everyone. <laughs> but, but it's so interesting that, that what I'm looking for, or what I need, when I go through that kind of carnivorous hunger <laughs> or, or, or quest, which is well, pretty often. cravings is a big thing as well. Why do we crave meat or sweets or cheese or, I don't know, or <clears throat> a glass of wine? Well, definitely when it comes to meat, the idea is there's, right. there's a spark of light in that animal, which is due to you. And, and, and that's really what you desire. It's not the meat. Because the second that spark returns to you, the meat, as long as is, is undesirable. Well, the best bite of the steak is the first bite. Well, for me, <laughs> just kind of continues. <laughs> so, sounds like we're now saying two contradictory things. We're which now aren't. having a cooking. We're, we're, this is a Food Network show uh, instead of a this, this is important because th we're saying two things that seem like they're contradictory, but they're not. On one hand, we're saying, you know, be, eat in moderation. Uh, restrict eating the wrong things. And then we're saying, oh, but if you crave something, it must mean that you have to elevate a spark of light from it. So on one hand, we're saying curb your cravings, curb your addictions. But if you are addicted to something, then you're meant to eat it. So it sounds like a contradiction. 
But it's not. We know it's not. How do you explain in layman terms for everyone to, to, to find that perfect balance of I'm addicted to something, I crave something, which according to Marcus, and we've spoken about this on a prior show, it means I must eat it if I crave it because it wants to be revealed. Yeah. But on the other hand, what we're saying is, oh, you got to overcome your addictions. Yeah. Well, well I, the study I've, I've read focuses specifically and solely on animals. It doesn't suggest that that chocolate gatto with that What's lava gatto gatto that that kind of lava that lava chocolate cake um, with the little vanilla ice cream that just melts into the middle and, and yes. kind of this this the volcano yes, right the I volcano yeah. it doesn't suggest the lights necessarily in that lava cake um, yeah. it's specifically about me but but um so there is a difference right there's a difference in 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 um in 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 uh, in the food that you crave it, you also make me think about the blessing that you do right because there has to be some restriction on on the food and and it's so interesting what do you mean when you say there has to be some restriction yeah you got to break that down for us marcus so <coughs> so when you want something in life the first thing you have to ask yourself is what part of you wants it is is it really that that your soul desires this or that your ego desires this Right. There are many things in life that are so healthy to do that you physically in the level of your ego will not want to do. In fact, much of your day can be disciplined around that. How many things today did I do that I didn't want to do? <laughs> right. So the question is, what part of you is eating? Is your soul eating or is your body eating? And so for me, even though I know we kind of steer uh, uh, away from being religious, but it is so interesting around the idea of, of a meditation before food. Because the idea of having a very scrumptious plate of something or the temptation of something sugary in front of you is then consumptive. And you can't help but kind of almost dive into that food and you, you haven't got, as, as David said, the chance to really chew or eat or masticate properly because you, you, you're just too excited by the consumption of. And, and the palate is so much... Inhaling versus you, eating. You inhale food, exactly. Yeah. You inhale food. And, and so... The idea of a kind of pause before you eat to really engage your consciousness to say, what part of me is eating? Is it my soul or my body? And so the structure of a prayer is not like, God, please bless this chicken I'm about to consume. It, it, it really is that you're bringing light down from the upper worlds. And there's a particular part of the prayer, which, which again, I love. It's when you say, you know, because the English translation is, is blessed are you. And it sounds obviously very kind of dogmatic, but it's not because the energy uh, clue of each word. There's a point when you say king of the world, as in, you know, the God, the, the creator is king of the world. And, and that's the point the Kabbalists say when you're eating to decide what is king to you. What is king to you? Are you just doing this blessing so you can slam this food in your mouth and inhale as fast as possible? Or is really the light in the food what's important to you what's king the food is king or the light in the food is king and that restriction to pause to contemplate and to elevate your desire so you can receive the light in the food is what is is what can attach you to the light in the food so, so that's the concept of, of restriction i'm saying i like it I want to address the actual title of the show briefly. And even though the truth is, Marcus, my the only notes that I had was literally this, and, and Marcus spoke about his own personal experience with it. We've shared through the last three episodes different principles and what we call spiritual laws around food and around eating, even drinking last week we talked about. But what the Kabbalists really emphasize is that you have to know yourself. And like Marcus said, he has somebody who's telling him, Marcus, meat is not good for you. Yet Marcus rises above and finds a way to elevate those sparks regardless. It's really the, the goal from the Kabbalistic point of view is for each one of us to have our own diet book. Like if I know that, um, I don't know, somebody's even asking here if, if, if eating animals repulses me, what does that mean? That means that you're not here in this lifetime to elevate those sparks. Maybe you have a gift to elevate the vegetable kingdom or fish or that, that that's your superpower, your talent. The, the goal is to be as in touch enough with our true selves 
that we can write our own diet manual. And when I say diet manual, I don't mean that the goal is to lose weight. The goal is to live in a balanced and healthful state. That's it. Spiritually balanced and healthful, physically balanced and healthful, emotionally balanced and healthful. I know someone, just to that point, that doesn't eat gluten, not because it messes with her digestion or it, she breaks out in hives, but because it makes her anxious. Now, think about how in tune you have to be with your body to recognize, I just had a croissant and now I'm having a panic attack. Not, rather than thinking the, the conditions in my life induced the panic attack or the issue that so-and-so is having is, is awakening the panic, it's actually the gluten. So I, in my years, and I, we talked a little bit about this last week, in my years of trying to lose weight and be you know, the optimum me I can be, I have tried literally every diet. Literally, okay, maybe not every diet, but everything from raw to vegan to keto to intermittent fasting to all carbs to no carbs to the cookie diet to the this and and everything illegal and in between, okay? <laughs> what are I, the illegal ones? I have <laughs> smuggled pills in from other countries. Let's put it that <laughs> way, okay? Wow. And, wow. and done things that I am not proud of. Wow. And I can tell you that let my research be your research. The secret, and I've, how much money? Imagine how much money over my X amount of years that I've been trying to do this. <laughs> how much money I've spent. Let my expense be your expense. Learn from my mistakes. You have your own diet, and you've got to figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And using that wisdom around the energy and around elevating sparks and the blessings and the co figure out what is your what's your meal plan. What sustains you? What nourishes you? And if it includes chocolate, and if it includes wine, and if it includes the steak, that's okay. Because doing it and treating it like it's not okay is like taking poison. Mm. It will inhibit your, um, what's the word? Um, absorption of any positive benefit you could get from those foods and that, th those habits. You could be eating salad 24-7. And if you feel bad about it, it will not help. It will not support your health in any way, shape, or form. So really, the 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 if you will if you look across every episode we've ever done, the underlying message of every episode is always the unseen is more important than the seen. the The consciousness is more important than the action. The intention is more important than the result. And eating food and nutrition is no different than and if you are getting healthy because someone wants you to lose weight there's a problem the real work is the inner work that's that's something that no one else can see including you you don't see it but you feel it and that's really where the shift comes it's more important somebody was commenting last week in the episode you know weight is not a good measurement of health it's true there are people who are you know, perfect body weight and desperately unhealthy. And there are people who are heavy that are in their, the prime health possible. So we're not talking about uh, certain measurements or sizes. We're talking about losing the spiritual baggage will help you be healthier physically. That's really it. I love it. Final, Final words? words? I thought I'd get some food with this show at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, on the way home we'll stop off for ice cream how's that <laughs> no I, I think I think um, for me that the spiritual weight loss is 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 profound in fact you, we haven't even got to talk about food maybe <laughs> because the subject of spiritual weight loss also pertains to um, baggage of unresolved past mm. which I think then emotionally come out as food addicty things um, but that's a whole separate subject but there is something to that it's a baggage of unresolved past that you're eating um, to deny I like it cliffhanger cliffhanger that's good well first of all Marcus thank you so much for being with us that you're you're a diamond among us Pisces so <laughs> we, we're glad to have you uh, always glad to have you all of your episodes are very uh, highly rated and and uh, listened to david salad thank you for being here being yeah. the inspiration of the episode 
Um, we are embarking on a new series next week, launching into talking about how our home, how our physical space, where we, where we hang our hat at the end of the day, how to make that space the most spiritual, powerful, and positive environment it can be. So get ready for that. Keep sending your questions. I love all of the feedback that we've been getting. It definitely helps us plan and prepare for future episodes. And um, as always, continue to like, rate, review, and comment. Have a fabulous week. Enjoy your food. And we'll see you next week on the Weekly Energy Boost. Mm -hmm.